Hey, this is Stephanie Bourbon. Today I am talking about revising your novel and I'm going to give you five steps that will help you revise your novel in a way that will get you to the finish line faster. Welcome back. Maybe you have written a novel during NaNoWriMo, so you have that messy first draft, which I love my messy first drafts. I love NaNoWriMo. Or maybe you've been working on a novel for a while and you have your first draft or your second draft, but you know that you need revisions. I'm going to give you five steps that I like to use when I revise novels. Okay, so let's get started. Number one is to go over your structure and plot arcs. And what I mean by that is every single story out there in the world follows some sort of structure. Okay. And in order to keep your readers engaged, you really need to make sure, especially if you're new, maybe you're a best selling author and then you don't need this because people are buying from your name. But when you're a little bit newer or lesser known, you definitely need to follow the structure. And so what I do is I have my messy first draft because I am a true pantser. I write the story. I tend to hit the arcs pretty well because I've been in the entertainment industry and the publishing industry for like three decades, actually longer because I've been acting since I was a kid and actively watching television, movies and reading books since I was a very small child. I constantly am involved in story. So for me, it just tends to hit because it's literally a lifetime of storytelling experience that I have. First step is to go over those plot arcs. And the way that I do it is I divide the book into sections. Okay. I take the book, I print it out, or I do it on my computer. Like I go into word. And if the book is 396 pages, I will go to about page 200, 205, something like that somewhere around 200 and I will cut it in half and make two separate word documents. The reason I do that is because I want to make sure that everything is hitting in the right place. Then I divide the back section in half and then I divide the first section in half. And that shows me if I have hit the new world. Okay. I'm going to give you some examples. If you are talking about your holiday movies or books, the new world is literally a new world. Your main character, she goes from a big city into usually a small town. Sometimes she goes from Los Angeles to Ireland, or sometimes she's in New York city, but maybe she has to live in the plaza for two weeks while she's uh, decorating the plaza. That actually was a movie I just saw called Christmas at the plaza. And I actually really, really enjoyed it, but she basically is living at the plaza while she's decorating the plaza. So there are lots of ways that you can have a new world. It could be in a story like the young adult novel, the fault in our stars, which is one of my favorite novels. I reread it every year. Hazel Grace doesn't literally go into a new world at this quarter mark of the book, but she is in a new world. She's in a new reality because she is now in a relationship with Augustus Waters. It doesn't have to literally be a new world like Harry Potter is a new world, but the story at the quarter mark has to have started. Something has changed for your character and they are now launched into the story that you are telling. Now go to the other side and at that it's the quarter again. So at the half of the half, which is 75% through your book, your story should be at your crisis, not your climax, but your crisis. Your crisis is the thing that will send your character into that all is lost moment. And yes, even in those holiday movies that I love so much, I love those movies and I love those books. There is the all is lost moment. It's usually when the character decides she's going to go back to her old life because maybe she thinks that she's made things worse in the small town, or maybe she uh, thinks that the person that she, her love interest isn't really reciprocating, or maybe she's not ready to fall in love or whatever her reasons are. She has an all lost moment. Something was the catalyst for that. Okay. Something happened in the fault in our stars, huge spoiler alert. If you have not read the fault in our stars, uh, Augustus actually dies and that sends Hazel Grace back down before she comes out of her. Basically he dies. She didn't want to get into a relationship because she thought she would hurt him, but you know, he died and it hurt her. So she fell down and then she came back up. So all stories need to have this. And when they come back up, that's called the climax, but I'll get to that in a minute. So what you want to do is first start with your middle, your insight, your new world and your crisis. Now in the middle, 
I strongly recommend you get the book called Write from the Middle. Writing from the Middle, it's by James Scott Bell. If you go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or maybe some small independent stores might have it as well. It is an amazing craft book on writing from the middle. In the middle of your story, your character needs to be having her recommitment scene or what James calls the mirror moment. I love this because it basically is the same thing. Your character is looking at the situation that she is in and deciding on whether she wants to stay in this situation or she wants to move forward in some way. The best storytelling has this, not just uh, commercial movies. The best storytelling will have a solid middle that moves your character one way or the other. So it's really, really important that you make sure that all these things are hitting. Now, if they are not hitting, then what you have to do is make scene cards. You can do this in Scrivener. You can do it with note cards. You can do it with post-it notes. You can do it in Word, but make sure that those scenes are hitting. Find a way to get them in there and move things around until they are. A lot of people during NaNoWriMo, myself included, sort of go up, 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 and then the middle gets a little bit mushy. It just does. It's the nature of blasting out a book in a month. A book is not like a screenplay. A screenplay is 90 to 100 pages and it's all dialogue, pretty much all dialogue. So it's if you have the story locked in your head, it's it actually takes less time to physically write than a novel because a novel is going to be 70 to 100,000 words, depending on the genre you're in, sometimes even more than that. To go into character and find her narrative arc. Now, this is basically following the story arcs that you just did, but making sure that for your character, her journey is hitting at the right places. Make sure that her wants, needs, and desires are clear. If something happens to her when she enters a new world, it has to be part of who she is, and that's why she entered her new world in the way that she did. In The Fault in Our Stars, Hazel Grace enters her new world with trepidation because she's not sure. She calls herself early on in the book, a grenade. She feels like she's going to explode because she's dying. So figuratively, she feels like she's going to blow up everybody around her and destroy her lives when she passes on. So she doesn't want to get into a relationship. So she enters into a relationship very differently than say Samantha Jones in Sex and the City enters a relationship or Carrie from Sex and the City enters a relationship or even Harry Potter, the way he makes friends is different. Everybody enters into their new world, whatever it is, going back to that small town if you're in that hallmark uh, sphere of writing or reading books like that writing those type of stories. Going back to that small town means something different. Me, I love cold weather and snow and mountains, so I would love to go to a small town. The way I would enter that world would be very, very different than somebody who doesn't like the mountains, who doesn't like small towns, who doesn't like snow. You know, everybody enters things in their own way, so only you can figure that out, and that is really based on your character. So go back in and ask yourself, why your character is acting the way that she is. It's very important that you understand her misbelief. If you read Lisa Crone's books, Wired for Story and Story Genius, you will understand about the misbelief. The misbelief is something that a character and all of us humans also believe about ourselves. that's not necessarily true, but it actually informs the way that we behave. It's actually what creates our character flaw which is why we make the decisions we make and why our characters make the decisions we make. So first step, go over your story plot arcs. If it's a story about uh, a boy who finds out he's a wizard, what needs to be in there I've, or goes to a school for wizardry. Obviously he has to, you have to have the moment when he finds out he's a wizard. You have to have the moment when he goes to the school. You have to have the moment when um, he decides whether he's going to stay in the school for wizardry or go back because maybe it's too scary. You have to have a crisis that happens. You have to have his all is lost. And then you have to have like uh, your climax, which is like a fight scene or where everything comes together. And then the end, that is the story. Then go into your characters and really uh, laser focus on why, who they are inside and how they're making the decisions and look at them at each of those plot points and make sure that it stays in character. Because when you set up your character at the beginning of the story, if she doesn't act that way or the things that she does isn't who she is, 
then it's going to pull the readers out of the story and they're going to remember that they're reading and or uh you know for television and movies the same thing you're like well i don't think that character would ever do that and you're like okay i'm gonna go buy popcorn or you know whatever you start messing around on your phone so make sure that in the beginning of your story your character is introduced properly uh, does the reader know who she is and what she desires need to know all that information and you can do it without a ton of backstory by just showing us the world that she lives in and then in her inciting incident which is the thing that launches in the story how she reacts to it and i think a really good example of this is the movie the holiday so if you look at iris and you look at amanda they have completely different personalities and the inciting incidents for both of them is that the person that they're involved in or want to be involved in it has ended for some reason or it should end so their inciting incident is uh like for iris it's that jasper gets engaged and for amanda it's that her boyfriend her living boyfriend cheats on her and you know what she really doesn't care so they that's the inciting incident that pushes them to decide to take this holiday and house swap and the house swap obviously that's the new world for that movie that story because it's really clear because they literally end up in a new world so i want you to really think about your character and your char character arcs as you're going back through and reside re ah, as you're going back through and revising your novels step three is your chapters okay so the way that i check my chapters is i go into every single chapter and i write on a literal note card uh i think i even have some right here um i take a note card <laughs> like an old school note card uh this comes from screenwriting and working uh in film for a long time but i write what happens in each chapter take the fault in our stars chapter one we meet hazel grace lancaster and we know that she has terminal cancer and i do that for every single chapter what is the main thing that happens in that chapter and a lot of times I realize oh my god nothing really happened in this chapter and then i just ditch it and i pull it out I write in chapters and I save every chapter as its own file. That's how I do it. Some people do it on Scrivener. You can do it any way you like, but that's how I do it. So I go back through and I check and make sure that every chapter moves the story forward and that my character's wants, needs, and desires are in there. And that is the next step. I don't go deeper than that. I don't go to the word level. I don't go into the layers of the chapter or any subtext. I just make sure that every chapter is moving the story forward. Now this seems like it's repeating, but it's not. Everything in story is connected. So you have your plot, your story plot, your arcs, that is the structure of the story you're telling. You have your characters, even if it's a character driven story, you still have the plot of the story. Okay. And you have your chapters or your scenes, which tell us how that all happens. And they all need to move us towards the end of the story. So that is step three is to go back in on the chapter level and really uh, make sure that each chapter is moving the story forward. And the way that I do it is I use note cards. Step four. So after you've done all these revisions, so you've already revised, you know it's working well, you have your character motivations, is then and only then do I go into the scene level. And the scene level is sort of like you're frosting on your cake, okay? Your scene level is what happens to move your chapters forward which moves your story forward okay uh let's go to the holiday again i'm going to use that because it's such a great movie and it's out you can watch it on streaming on several networks right now it's december and here is if i was going to write down the scenes for the holiday like number one you know we meet iris we know that she works in publishing and she's a little bit sad okay let's just do iris's first because it's a it's a dual point of view story but we'll do iris uh i'm just going to do iris for this example but there's also amanda but let's just do iris so iris find she we meet iris we know she works in publishing we know she's in love with someone there's unrequited love she actually says that because it's a voiceover which i don't like voiceovers but it works this would work great as a book and then she finds out that jasper is engaged and then she decides that she needs to go on holiday then she gets on a plane and she flies to the united states then she arrives to california and then she wakes up happy then she meets um jack i can't think of his name right now jack black's character um 
Miles? His name is Miles. I just watched the movie last week too. But you know what I mean? Like all these things happen in order. So write down every scene that happens and make sure that they are moving the story forward. Usually novels have about 62 scenes. Some have more, some have less. But if you have a lot of scenes where it's just two characters talking and nothing is literally happening, if it's not moving the story forward, then you can get rid of it. Step five. And this is almost like the decorations that are top of the icing that's on the cake. Uh, a lot of people focus on this earlier. It's one of the first comments when I'm working with writers one-on-one. -on -one. It's usually one of the biggest, biggest picture, big picture issues that I see. Every writer does it. I've done it. Uh, you've done it. Every writer does a showing versus telling, okay? Everybody has a habit. They want to tell everybody the backstory. They want to give the entire history of the world of, you know, the character. So, for example, the holiday. I have no idea why Iris is the way she is. I don't know anything about her parents. I don't know if she has self-confidence issues. I don't know if she was bullied in high school. I don't know if she was just never popular. I don't know if she's shy. These are things that I'm sort of guessing based on where she is. We know she's smart because she works at this publishing company. But uh, we find out later when we meet her brother that her whole family is in publishing. So we know that she's smart. She's a little bit of a bookworm and she's dependable and she's reliable, but she never puts herself first. I don't have any backstory of that. I learned that about her. I learned it about her through her actions and her dialogue and the things that she does and the way that she approaches things with Jasper, for example. She is always waiting for him and hoping that he is going to be there for her. Now, Amanda, on the other hand, we see Amanda tells us, I don't love this. I love this movie. I don't love this, but she tells us that she can't cry. Okay. She breaks up with her live-in boyfriend and she doesn't cry. We see that, but she also says like, I can't cry. It's not who I am. When she's talking to her boyfriend and they're breaking up, she's just like, oh, it's just not who I am. She's very focused on work. So what we know about Amanda based on her actions, is she pushes everybody away. She holds everybody out here. Okay. And she focuses on work instead of allowing herself to get close to people. There's a reason for that. I don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. There's not scenes and scenes and scenes of backstory. So when people are telling us all this backstory, it's usually backstory, not always. It's because they feel like we need that information, but we really, really don't. And the biggest, the biggest thing about showing versus telling is what immediately happens when I, when I work with writers and I say, please show, don't tell, then they start showing us the way the character is standing. Now, I mean, this is a video, so I'll give you an example. If I'm doing this and I'm talking to you, it's definitely a different personality than if I'm like standing up straight and I'm reading from the screen or blah, blah, blah. It tells you something about me. It shows you something about who I am, but that is not what I mean. While those visual cues are important, that's not what I'm talking about. Showing versus telling in the true sense of the word is showing us who the character is. Okay. It is showing us who the character is through her actions and her dialogue. If you look at Hazel Grace Lancaster, she was afraid to have anybody in her life because she knew she was dying and she didn't want to hurt anybody. And that was based off something that happened when she first got sick and her parents were so sad. So she thought, oh my God, if I die, it's going to blow everything up. So I can never get close to anybody. So the way that she held people off was based on that. And we learned that early on in the book. Everything that she does is with a little bit of worry that she's going to hurt people until she enters in her new world and allows herself to love somebody. And then we see her change. And the same thing, we, even when she carries on, she does things a very specific way. Harry Potter does things a very specific way. He's trying to really find out who he is and learn who he is. But the way he behaves is sort of based on that he's not good enough because he was abused as a kid. Now, we did get that information in the first chapter, but it wasn't like, or maybe it was chapter two, at the beginning when we learn he's living under the stairs with the Dursleys and we know he, they're abusing him, but they don't come out and say it and they don't explain that much of it. We know his aunt and uncle are really, really against the wizarding world and they hate that, um, they even have to deal with this child. They think he's a freak. You know, they're very close minded people. And, but we don't have pages and pages and pages of backstory. We see that through the things that happen with Harry. And when he goes to school 
he doesn't have the confidence that say Hermione does. Now Hermione also we learn later on that she's a half blood and that she that's why she's type A. That's why she, everything she does has to be perfect because she's trying to prove herself. And every action that Hermione takes in those stories is based on her proving to herself and to others that she's perfect. So when you talk about showing versus telling, it's really showing us who the character is based on that misbelief I talked about before. And if you don't understand what the misbelief is, please go get Lisa Crohn's Wired for Story and Story Genius. She talks about it. They Both those books will help you. It's a lot of theory theoretical stuff but it really makes sense and if you look at your own family I mean one exercise you can you can do is you can look at your own family and say like here's the situation so maybe it's Black Friday let's take Black Friday because it just happened and uh, Black Friday your mom loves discounts let's just say for the example of this your mom loves discounts so she's all about Black Friday she is up at 5 a.m. she's waiting in line uh, to wait for the mall to open wait for you know Best Buy to open or whatever so she can get everything on sale now your father hates crowds hates crowds doesn't want to be in the mall doesn't want to drive would rather pay full price he's not going to the mall He's approaching Black Friday like, I'm going to stay home. You go deal with it. Your sister, maybe she's a shopaholic. So she doesn't care. She just wants to spend money like crazy. And maybe you yourself are a bit of an introvert and you're not a huge fan of crowds. So you stay home and buy everything online or play video games or watch movies or maybe you work. Everything is based on who you are as a person. Everything that happens within your own family. So think about an exercise to figure out the showing versus telling is think about your own family or your close friends. Put them in a situation and put yourself in the situation and really think about how they would act and how you would act. That is showing versus telling. Not the way we're standing and stuff. Really, really great examples of this are in television, especially sitcoms. Dramas, I notice even the good dramas, the really strongly written dramas, a lot of the characters tend to act very similar uh, because they're also serious. But in sitcoms, you really notice the difference in personalities. Take uh, Friends, for example, you have six characters. They are all completely different characters. The way that they approach every single scene is different. Phoebe's just like, whatever. Joey a lot of times doesn't understand what's going on, but doesn't care that he doesn't understand what's going on. Ross needs to make sure that everybody knows the right way to do everything. Monica needs to take control of everything and make sure it's neat and tidy and organized. Rachel doesn't so much care. She's a little bit of a pushover. They all enter scenes uh, very differently the same exact scene a great example is the one when no one's ready it is season three episode two it might be episode three but I believe it's episode two season three it's called the one when no one's ready it is an amazing example of showing versus telling uh, you can watch it on HBO Max or they tend to run it all the time on TNT and, and channels like that but it's one of the best episodes it's really 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 strong so that uh, those are my tips for revisions. I hope that it's helpful. I have created a workbook so and uh, go into the description below and you can grab the workbook. There is a link. I am also offering a limited availability. I can only really bring in a handful of writers at this for anybody who won NaNoWriMo. If you won NaNoWriMo, send me an email at stephanie at judanibean.com with a screenshot of your NaNoWriMo win or a link to your profile so I can see that you won it. I am offering 50% discount handful of people like I said it's a very small number I'm looking at my schedule I'm trying to get everybody in but I really can't do too many people but you can use it the entire year of 2022 the only caveat is you got to sign up and pay for it now it's 50% off my full manuscript evaluation because a lot of times when we write that first draft it's messy and we can't see it we cannot see what's not working especially because we did it so fast so it's a really really great idea if you don't want if you don't work with me work with a writing coach of some kind get other eyes to look at your manuscript if you really right now are not in a financial position that you can hire a coach uh while that makes me sad because working with coaches is amazing and i'm not just saying that because i am also a coach it's why i became a coach but i uh there are a lot of writing coaches who offer like you know free first pages and and there's so many things online that you can find and you can take workshops uh, have your critique group read if you have beta readers or you can maybe go on Facebook and join you know there's a lot of groups where you can do a manuscript swapped it's really good to get fresh eyes on your brand new manuscript and 
not this is not about making your words perfect this is focusing completely on the story so if you want to take advantage of my offer i have a link below uh, in the description also or you can just send me that email and i hope that this was helpful for you i know i went through a lot of things super fast but i'm really excited uh that you have a novel done and that you are about to embark on revisions because it's a really super fun process once you have the uh bottom layer of your cake which is your story and your characters now let's build it up and make it perfect Okay, thank you and have an amazing day. Thanks for watching. Cheers.